Okay, we'd like to welcome you back to part two of our current event and weekly Bible study for February 15th, 2009. And we're going to continue with the last article from um, this article that uh, Clarence Patterson had sent, uh, Pastor Clarence Patterson. And he, this next section is entitled, All Churches Are Now Required to Join the IRS Super Church. Two other developments concerning the IRS control of churches has risen recently that should literally send shockwaves through the religious community. First, while the churches are arguing doctrinal positions among themselves, the IRS has now developed its own super church. Independent Baptists in particular pride themselves in their anti-ecumenicism. No fundamental preacher worth his salt would be caught dead at the local church federation meeting where he has to rub shoulders with a liberal preacher. However, they don't think twice about paying a large fee to go to Chitwood or a CLA seminar, a uh, Christian Law Association. These are the ones, these are the organizations out there that are, that are um, encouraging all of the 501c3 corporate churches to be good little Nazis and toe the line and, and do whatever you're told. Okay? And really, they have a right to say that because if they're in that system, then they should be abiding by their rules. I mean, isn't that biblical? I mean, from the standpoint, it's not biblical to be in it. But if you chose to be in it, then you should abide by their rules or get out. There's no in-between. There's no gray area with this. Um, going further, it says uh, they don't think twice about paying a large fee to go to Chitwood or CLA seminar to sit next to one of those religious outcasts to learn how to be a good IRS-approved church and pastor. Um, and when he says religious outcasts, I believe he would mean people of, of other denominations where you couldn't get saved in their church if you tried. At least at an independent fundamental Baptist church, you can hear the gospel most of the time. Uh, of course, I haven't been in one in a while, so I, I don't know, but I imagine you still can. Uh, but there's some churches where you haven't been able to get saved for, who knows, who knows if you're ever able to get saved. You know, uh, th This goes further in it when it says, it is now a fact that in order to keep and get a tax-exempt status, a church must agree that all religions are equal. The new application for recognition of exemption form 10023, Schedule A, for churches, uh, revised September of 1998, demands, now this, these are IRS forms, they demand a declaration to this effect with the following words at point three. Quote, does the organization require prospective members to renounce their religious beliefs of, uh, or other membership in other churches or religious orders to become members? If yes, please describe, because Big Brother's watching you. They want to know what you're, you know, you can't do that, according to them. And then it says it doesn't take much intelligence to figure out where they're going to go with all this. In order to be considered a legal church, tax-exempt tax in America, the church or religious organization will have to declare that all religions are equal. Isn't that the essence of the coming one world religion? Isn't that what the abomination saying right now? All religions are basically equal. Isn't even that what the Pope is, is starting? Now, granted, I understand the Catholic Church views them as superior, but they're meeting with all these other sects of, of religion out there, telling them to all come together, all get on the same page, and we know, according to the Bible, that the coming one world, new world order, the coming one world government, one world political system, one world currency, and one world religious system, under the Antichrist and the false prophet, we're all going to have to get on the same page. So, this is a tremendous way... To, to accomplish that by corrupting the churches of America, leavening them to the point where they're all going to be basically on the same playing field. Whether you have a different doctrinal stance than another one, you're still under the same 501c3 corporate umbrella with, with the state as your creator. It's just unbiblical. Uh, so, he says, they will have to declare that they do not believe that their doctrinal position only results in converts to their faith having eternal life. Um, in other words, they, they're either going to have to lie to the IRS or they're going to have to declare that they do not believe that their doctrinal position only results in converts to their faith, having eternal life. In other words, there's many paths to God. Broad is the way which leads to destruction and many there be that go thereat. Narrow is the way which leads to life eternal and few there be that find it. But when you're in a corporate 501c3 sense, understand you're yoked up with all these other ungodly 501c3 uh, religious groups that are in the same boat as you, including the First Church of Satan, I'm not lying, including Wicca organizations, white witchcraft, 
All kind of pagan organizations have 501c3. The Unitarian Church, one of the most ungodly, satanic, Catholic Church, you name it. So if they go further, they must renounce this narrow, inclusivist position. Maybe we now know why Billy Graham, Robert Schuller, Pat Robertson, and other TV preachers have been making such fuzzy remarks about adherence of other religions. Through sincere going to... Um, uh, those sincere going to heaven without receiving Christ uh, and these other religions but see if, if you're part of the system you're not really supposed to be speaking out against the other 501c3 corporation because all religions are equal according to the IRS you understand the, the, the compromise that sets in a spirit of compromise we're talking about here and that's just one of the spirits that I believe that enters in when you take this exemption, the status, this, this corporate status, is the tax exemption. Uh, in that tax exemption is government subsidy. According to the Supreme Court case uh, in Bob Jones University, it is clear that the U.S. government will not support any religion that clings to the narrow-minded belief that salvation is in Jesus Christ alone. Remember, come shekels, come shackles. They give you the shekels, the money, well... You, you may find yourself being in shackles later. You take the benefit now. You, 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 you take what the devil is offering you, which is, this is a deal from the devil. Here, here's this 501c3 corporate size. Sign on the dotted line. I'll give you privileges. I'm the devil. I would never deceive you. And he doesn't come with a red tail and a pitchfork. Okay? Doesn't, it's not like that at all. He's not that stupid. But that's exactly what we're dealing with here. Going further, the world church isn't coming, it's already here. And the preachers don't have a clue as they go merrily along, hand in hand with the great harlot, to the wedding with the Antichrist. I like the way this guy writes, Revelation 17. Uh, one of the reasons the IRS gave, um, to, gave to Tex Mars Living Truth Ministries for removing their tax-exempt status is as follows. Quote, much of the material you disseminate, and this is what the IRS was saying to Tex Mars, much of the material you disseminate promises to address possible conspiracy or threats, either individuals, groups, or various agencies against Christianity, freedoms, or other rights. This is evident from a review of your newsletters and order forms. The titles and the promotional materials are designed to sensationalize the gra and grab the reader's attention. This is a, I'll be honest, this is a big... I, the Lord's convicted me just to pretty much give everything away that I have. Um, my material, my information, freely have you received, freely have you freely give. Okay, so I've tried to do that. Okay, but um, I tell you what, this is always in the back of my mind. If you get into selling a lot of stuff, you're, you become a, a big target as well. Uh, because now you're making merchandise off what you're doing, and that potentially could really come back to get you. You're creating paper trails and things of this nature. Now, I'm not saying everybody that's selling anything is wrong, okay? I may even in, in, in the near future possibly come out with a, uh, a book that you can buy regarding all my health, all my newsletters and all my health recommendations on one. Um, uh, but I may or may not do that. I don't know yet, okay? But uh, that wasn't even my idea, and I don't really have a whole lot of motivation, but I know it could help a lot of people as well. But when you start going down this whole merchandise road, you've, you've almost got to be set up as a corporation. Okay, there are ways, I, I would imagine, around it. But man, you're, you're, you're almost forced to go into that model. And again, you didn't see the apostles and all these other people going around, you know, selling stuff and doing this or doing that. It, was, it just was not something that we have a biblical example to do. Okay, so going further... Um, this is what the IRS was saying to Tex Mars. This is evident from a review of your newsletters and, and order forms. The titles and promotional materials are designed to sensationalize and grab your reader's attention. They usually imply that the works will expose certain prominent groups. That the works will... They usually imply that they... You know, I'm not sure how they worded that, but they will expose certain prominent groups, individuals, politicians, and governmental agencies as being part of or linked to a threat or conspiracy. One of the titles that the IRS gave as an example included Bible prophecy and the conspiracy. 
Any grade school child in Sunday school knows that you can't teach or write on Bible prophecy without dealing with the second coming of Jesus Christ. But just as the Russian pastors and the communists were forbidden to speak on the subject, we are now coming to the same place in our, in our land that we live in. It is obvious that if one believes in the literal return of the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be considered a domestic terrorist. In, and that's whether you believe pre-trib, pre-wrath, or post-trib, you know. Anyway, you slice it, they're going to not like that. So, in that, the Lord Jesus Christ will destroy the wicked government upon his return in great glory and break the back of the Gentile world rule. And this is, that's particularly at the end of the tribulation. I don't think any of us would argue that. Uh, this message isn't popular with the in for hells and the high-heeled bell, bells that run our country today. He's using some euphemisms there. Of course, they don't believe that he is coming, obviously, the wicked and godly political system. Uh, but they believe that we, we who do believe he's coming will be involved in what they call self-fulfilled prophecies and try to hasten his coming by blowing up everything in sight. Oh, yeah, right. We have a lot of biblical mandate to do that. But, again, some of the, the, the factions of the IRS would say this. Further evidence of the type of antichrist thinking surfaced recently when a brochure put out by the FBI in Phoenix, Arizona, named Potential Domestic Terrorist. Now, I have a copy of this brochure. I've sent out on a couple different occasions in newsletters. It's an actual picture of this brochure, and it says that law enforcement should be aware of these potential domestic terrorists. One of the groups is the doomsday cult type. Obviously, this would include Bible-believing preachers and churches in America. We do not only believe that there will be a literal doomsday, we believe the Lord Jesus Christ will bring the doom when he comes, Revelation 6, uh, 12 and 17. He won't do any good to claim that your church is not a cult at that point. The IRS definition fits the average Bible-believing church to a T. Uh, well, I don't know if the average, but <laughs> it fits some of them. Many have asked if we can actually show them this in the law. The answer is no, we can't because you won't find a specific law that says you can't preach on the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's because they don't have to write a law to gain the same effect. All Congress has to do is give or out, give an outlaw agency like the IRS carte blanche privilege of making up their own so-called laws as they go along. The churches agreed to this when they signed their tax-exempt contract. They said that they would obey all laws, federal and state, local, presently and in the future, and they apparently didn't read the fine print. The new churches filing for tax exemption must agree to the following. Quote, the corporation or organization shall have no power to take any action that would be required for tax exemption under the Internal Revenue. Code section 501c3 and related regulations, rulings and procedures, um... Okay, that was part of it. It is now the procedure of the IRS to refuse tax-exempt status to those churches that will not agree that all religions are equal and who refuse to join through tax exemption or the world, coming world church. Also, preaching on Christ's coming is also taboo. In the Baptist Temple case, the church learned that the New Testament church does not legally exist in the U.S. today because there are no longer any... Uh, First Amendment protections left. The genius of the First Amendment in the various religious freedom clauses of the 50 states is that, for the first time in history, the New Testament church could be, could exist legally without having, in the words of the IRS, a legal, distinct legal existence. Now even a New Testament church will be assigned by force the legal status of an association and will be expected to meet the same standards that the not-for-profits have to meet. But they still won't have their God-given right of a, of a non-taxable status. The status is in contrast to an exempt status, which is a privilege and not a right. The evidence as to what we are saying, though denied by most preachers, was made clear on January 24th this year in Tampa, Florida. Now, this was in 2004. IRS agent Melvin Blau testified in a federal court, quote, that once a church obtains the status of 501c3 under the IRS, they are trapped. The only way to be removed from a 501c3 status is if the IRS chooses to remove the exemption. And you know they're not going to do that. Not willingly. So if you dissolve the corporation and continue on as ABC Church, as an unincorporated church, you're still trapped in their web and still under their control. He further testified that a church is automatically exempt under federal law without a 501c3 designation. He also stated under oath that church requests the status 
just to get the government's stamp of approval. Not God's approval, but just the government's approval. So again, that's, that's some more information for you there. We're going to go to the next article, which was written by Barbara Cate, a personal friend of mine who works with Dr. Dixon, um, I believe at the uh, Biblical Law Center. Uh, you can find her. Uh, I'll give you her contact information at the end. And uh, if you go to unregisteredbaptistfellowship.com, unregisteredbaptistfellowship.com, you'll be able to find them. And uh, you can get their, their contact information. And uh, she can be very helpful. This is a, another just dynamite, insightful article. And again, the reason I'm going over this is because every one of these different articles are giving you another dimension to this subject that is building upon the last. And then this is entitled, A 501c3 Incorporated Church, The Real Truth, by Barbara Cate. She says, Okay, pastors, evangelists, missionaries, deacons, trustees, elders, listen up. Let's stop all the hocus-pocus, the illusions, the scams, and the fairy tales, and the outright lies regarding what a 501c3 incorporated church is and is not. For a change, let's deal with facts. For those of you who don't understand facts in the legal arena, facts are used and are supported by documented evidence, which would be admissible in a legitimate court of law. Facts are not hyperbole. The downside of a 501c3 corporation are as follows. The creator of a corporation is the state, number one. The next one, the state is the sole authority and sovereign head over the corporation it created. Not Jesus Christ, but the state. Next point, corporation is subject to the laws of the state which limits its powers. The corporation has no constitutional protected rights. The corporation is an artificial person. The corporation submits to a state charter, declaring it a creature of the state. The corporation is created for the benefit of the public. The corporation is a state franchise. The corporation is a privilege granted by the state. These are all legal. I mean, she, she's heavily involved in, um, you know, she's been heavily involved in the legal system. And she knows what she's talking about. Barbara does. She has her own talk show as well. You could probably do a keyword search for Barbara Kate, K-E-T-A-Y. And she's got a, uh, uh, like a, I think it's up on the internet and radio. And um, you can find her. And, uh, you know, she's got a lot of great information. And then it goes on to say the above statements are facts. They were not invented by this author in order to make a point. They were established by case law precedents, if you will. They are still good law, never having been overturned. There are at they, therefore, they are still in full force and effect. In the landmark case of Hale versus Henkel, the U.S. Supreme Court stated the following regarding corporations. Quote, upon the other hand, the corporation is a creature of the state. It is presumed to be un un or incorporated for the benefit of the public. Not the benefit of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the benefit of the public. It receives its special privileges and franchises and holds them subject to the laws of the state and the limitations of its charter. Its powers are limited by law. It can make no contract not authorized by its charter. Its rights to act as a corporation are only preserved to it so long as it obeys the law of its creation. Oh, this sounds so biblical, you know. Continuing with Hale versus Hinkle, the court also stated regarding corporations, there is no clear distinction in this particular between an individual and a corporation, and in that the latter has no right to refuse to submit its books and the papers for examination at the suit of the state. While an individual may lawfully refuse to answer incriminating questions unless protected by an immunity statute, it does not follow that a corporation vested with certain privileges and franchises may refuse to show its hand when charged with such an was charged with such an abuse of, abuse of privileges. In other words, if you're a corporation, you don't have any right to refuse to show everything that you've got in your church to the very governmental agency that created you and gave you your right to exist. So, she goes on to say, do you get it? Can you see the trap? A 501c3 corporation being an artificial person is not considered a person under the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, 
um, religious liberty clause, or under the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution, protection against self-incrimination clause, therefore an incorporated church has no First and Fifth Amendment rights. In the case of Johnson v. Goodyear, uh, it's stated, this is from 1899, quote, a corporation being an artificial person only has rights within the meaning of the due process and equal protection clauses of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution and similar provisions of state constitutions and within the meaning of state statutes. So now we talk about the dirty side of the 501c3 corporation, which is it may exist in perpetuity, perpetuity, like perpetually. Uh, it is required by law to serve the state. It must support the government agenda, all public policy. It is really tax. It is not really tax exempt because it pays Social Security taxes. It is considered just another business. It is governed by a board of directors. Again, the board of directors are considered the deacons, and the CEO is considered the pastor of this corporation. Like any corporation has a board of directors and CEO. Well, this is the same thing. It's no different. I mean, what can you? Was Jesus the CEO? And the apostles, the board of the directors, if they would have had, and of course they never would, but if they would have had a modern day corporate church in America, that's how the IRS would designate them, whether they designated themselves that or not. The IRS will do it for you. Been done. And then the other thing, yeah, the last point is to dissolve the 501c3 corporation, you must first give all your assets, if you have any, to another 501c3 corporation. You see how this is such a trap? And then if you do not do this, the state will take your assets and distribute them for you to other 501c3 corporations. See, once you're in this brotherhood, this 501c3 IRS corporate brotherhood, it's like the mafia. You can't get out. Well, you can, but it's, and it's not easy. But that's why people like Barbara Cate, um can show you how to do that. Okay? I don't know the procedure. I, I can't specialize in everything. But I can help point you in the right direction, at least. So, you know the statement, there is nothing new under the sun. Well, this is certainly true about corporations. The corporation, as we know it today, was perfected by the Romans around 250 B.C. You realize how old this is? The Romans. Okay? It had all the legal attributes that we know today. These are called legal maxims, which all originated with Rome. Now, we know so much good's come out of Rome, you know, Roman Catholic Church. We got the false Bibles that came up, the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus that came up through, um, and then Westcott and Hort, the two high-level occultists translated into the revised version, which spawned all of our modern-day versions. You know, we got the, you know, the, the harlot in Rome, and, you know, it's, Rome's produced some really good fruit, you know. We, we, none of us could argue that, and I'm being obviously facetious here, but, um, all of this originated in Rome. Bondage. Isn't that funny how bondage, so much bondage originated there came and still exists to this day. And they survived to this day as the growing legal dictum. Remember, the Romans were pagans and they controlled every facet of their society, including the legal system. And this, think about this, it evolved ultimately into the Roman Catholic Church, which is what ultimately ended up continuing. Because we don't have the Roman Empire, per se, like we did back then. But the Roman Catholic Church has still continued on. Okay, and as strong as ever. And will most likely be the covering under which all the other churches come in the coming one world religion. It's most set up to do that. In the Roman Empire, there were no individual or personal liberties. The only benefits and privileges you received were state-sanctioned. The great and mighty supreme authority over everything was the state. In all matters, nothing in Rome or in their provinces could be done without the state's license and permission. And, and again, think about this. All these preachers out there having to get their licenses so that they can preach. How is that biblical? I mean, Pilgrim's Progress, remember that? Where, you know, he wouldn't take a license, got thrown in jail. Oh, but today we don't think anything about it. We're, we're, they're so far entrenched into the system, into this corporate uh, 501c3 system, that, you know, it's like you're too close to the forest to see the trees. You don't think anything of any of this. Licensing and all this garbage that's totally unbiblical. 
All it is is, is like um, chains that weigh you down. And these are chains that also blind you to the truth. It's, it's really a sad state of affairs. It really is. So, the great and mighty supreme authority over everything was the state. In all matters, in, in all matters, nothing in Rome and in the provinces could be done without the state's license and permission. Incorporation became mandatory by 6 A.D. for all spontaneous collect, collectivities of persons. Quote, that was a quote. Rome literally had hundreds of deities which they permitted to be worshipped. Okay, and that's, again, that kind of flies in the first commandment, you know, that shall have no other gods before me which is what we quoted about this whole situation, when you incorporate, isn't that putting another God before you? Oh, who's, who's the creator of your church? Who's the head? The Lord Jesus Christ? No. The IRS is the head. He, that, that's your, the creator. Okay, so, they permitted all these hundreds of deities to be worshipped. But the key word here is permitted. The Lord's church was not only persecuted because of who they worshipped, they were persecuted because of the refusal to seek permission from the state by becoming incorporated. The Lord's church was considered illicit because of this refusal. Sounds like what we have today, doesn't it? Does it not? So, they were, the Lord's church was persecuted because of the refusal to seek permission from the state by becoming incorporated. Well, that's why a lot of churches today would not even think about not incorporating. They don't want to be have the wrath of the IRS or anyone else, and it's only going to get worse. So, but, you know, pretty pretty pathetic situation we have going on here. Um, but the Lord's Church was not considered illicit because of this refusal. Rather, they would be con commended of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ. This section is specifically for the pastors who masquerade their 501c3 corporations as a church, who continually allow the church to be demeaned as an underling, a subordinate, and a dependent of the state. For its pastors who have crawled to Caesar with bones shaking and quivering to seek the almighty mythical tax exemption and subsidies, it's, it's for pastors who choose Caesar's favor over obedience to God. And sadly, it's for pastors who should be able to grasp this simple Bible doctrine. See, this is simple. I mean, isn't this like a no-brainer subject that we're talking about today? Yet, there's hardly any pastors that will yield, give in, or even acknowledge this. Wow, it's like they've been blinded. It's like the prince of this world has blinded their eyes that the Bible talks about. It's really like that. So, um... Or worse yet, do you think you're smarter than the Lord? Then this section is for you. And this goes on to say, The 501c3 Incorporated Church, and we're just going to go through different things here, has no First and Fifth Amendment rights as provided by the United States Constitution. Because your corporation is an artificial person, the corporation only has due process and equal protection under the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution, and similar provisions of state constitutions and within the meaning of state statutes. Uh, point two, must, they must adhere to all public policy, which restricts the pastor to preaching politically correct sermons. That's what they should be preaching. Politically correct sermons. Hey, you were the one that chose to get it, or take it over, or whatever. You should play by their rules if you're going to, if you're going to, you know, they, they're supposed to uh, police preach politically correct sermons, which do not assault anyone's dignity or self-esteem. This means no speaking out about the character of political candidates, abortion, sodomy, homosexuals, the government, war, sin, no propaganda which equals the spreading of doctrine, which would definitely include the gospel. You know, you got to play by their rules if you're in their system. And then she goes on to say, oh, I know you're saying nobody tells me what to preach. Because you hear that a lot when this subject comes up. Really? Then obviously you're not aware of the 1954 Lyndon Baines Johnson uh, was sick and tired of pastors and the congregations wielding influence over voters. He declared it was time that the most powerful public forum, the church, be silenced. He proposed that in exchange for a tax-exempt status, the church would have to agree to keep silent on matters 
which the government considered forbidden. If they did not cooperate, there would be no tax amnesty for the transgressors. The rest is history. Now, just because they haven't enforced this, again, it's like, okay, Satan's going to let you come in, he's going to put you in the trap, you're going to be in the trap. Maybe he's not going to enforce it, but Caesar's going to call in the chips. He's calling in the chips right now. I mean, if you're going to live for the devil, you might as well do it right. You know, if you're going to live for the devil, you might as well go all the way with it. Choose whom this day you're going to serve. Are you going to be hot or are you going to be cold? Uh, here's another thing about the 501c3 church. Uh, it's just another business under the federal and state statutes and the regulations and the IRS. You have placed the Lord's church in the same category with immoral, wicked, and despicable groups and organizations. Now, I mentioned this earlier, but I'm going to go further. 501c3 corporate churches are in the same bed with Planned Parenthood, the most wicked organization probably on the planet, the baby-killing organization Planned Parenthood, atheists, witches, Satanists, pornographers, pedophiles, and hundreds of other organizations all seeking legitimacy from a 501c3 corporation as a way to raise tax-deductible money for their perverted activities. Is that who you want to be yoked up with? That, that one point by itself should all you need to, need to hear about this whole subject. This, this by itself would, would be all I would need. I'm sorry. It, it, I'm not saying I'm Mr. Perfect. I'm just saying that this is so cut and dry. From so many different vantage points, it's so cut and dry. But that one point alone. And then, uh, other things about the 501c3 church. Church properties are held in trust for the public. Um, in such public purposes, powers and activities are defined and limited by federal statutes and by the regulations of the IRS commissioner and are in total submission to the state and federal authorities. Uh, these churches are considered to be perpetual and cannot be dissolved or unincorporated unless until all assets are merged into another 501c3 organization. And then the next point, they have, uh, have agreed to allow the Internal Revenue Service to be the final arbitrator and authority of what is and is not a church. The IRS has that right to define what is and is not a church. They do have that right. If they created you, they, they're the ones that make the rules. Uh, the IRS has the, is the final arbiter to certify religion and to state who can, who we can worship and what we can or cannot believe and who we can give our tithes to. Now, granted, just because they haven't implemented that, the IRS, at yet, doesn't mean they don't have the authority to do it, because they're your creator as a 501c3 corporation. It's a sad commentary about the church of our day, when the church feels compelled to go to sinners to seek legitimacy. Another point, they, um, the church can now be sued, uh, can now sue and be sued, Corporation does little or nothing in the way of actually protecting the church. The legal truth is that a church cannot be sued and brought into court until it incorporates. Because then it becomes a legal entity that can be sued. Prior to incorporation, a church is not a recognized legal, recognized in law as a legal entity. If the court cannot legally recognize it, it cannot be sued. They want to get you on their, on their playing field. And until you take this, this uh, corporate status, you're not on their playing field yet. So it's very important for them to have this, these churches on their playing field because then they can control them. A church is not subject to the jurisdiction of any court, a true church. However, when a church incorporates, it most clearly, certainly may be sued. Uh, until the church incorporated, it was completely outside the purvey and jurisdiction of civil gov government. This is a critical legal truth that seldom, if ever, will be discussed with you by your attorney. This is if, like, a pastor was going to go to his attorney about his 501c3 corporate church and have questions. Okay? The 501c3 church establishes within, with the government, an unholy alliance. I think we've established that. The church and the corporation are each distinct, uh, are each distinct, separate, and mutually exclusive entities. Therefore, when a church incorporates, the church does not merge uh, with the corporation. A symbiotic relationship is established wherein an incorporated church promotes the work of the church through the corporation and the public interest. 
the work of the corporation and the state are promoted through the incorporated church. This unholy alliance has resulted in the incorporated church being assimilated into promoting the philosophies and vain deceits after the traditions of man of the world as enforced by civil government. Uh, next point. Obviously, God obviously is not sovereign over this 501c3 corporate church. He has no place of honor. The church is an institution, the true church, a true New Testament church, is an institution ordained and established by Jesus Christ himself, and the Christ has never delegated his authority to any civil jurisdiction to rule in the affairs of that church. In fact, give me a book, chapter, verse on that. Christ bequeathed this authority unto the state. It's not in there. The 501c3 incorporated church publicly declares that Jesus Christ is no longer competent to govern, protect, and provide for his own church. The Lord's church has allowed itself to be gelded and emasculated by the United States government's so-called favors and privileges. The, the government slash Satan's favors and privileges. I'll add that in. It is too apathetic, intimidated, and fearful to understand it was already guaranteed by the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, all rights, freedoms, liberties, and protections. The courts have always recognized a church is not an entity recognized in law. Therefore, they have no jurisdiction over the church. How is it then that the Lord's church can't get this? They automatically commit spiritual suicide by voluntary giving jurisdiction to the state by incorporating. You see how important this is from a biblical standpoint? I mean, the more I read about this and the more I study, the more I realize how critical this is from the viewpoint of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, we're, we're here, we're, we're trying to live our lives to please Him, right? How could any of this be pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you just going to plead ignorance? I didn't know. Okay, well, you, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. I, I'm sorry, not in that regard. It's a very dangerous place to set yourself in. And hopefully we're getting that point across today here. Uh, how is it that the Lord's Church cannot grasp that the First Amendment was an act of God's wisdom and providence in order to safeguard His church and maintain its independence from the state. The First Amendment is the highest legal form of real protection ever known in the history of the church. And it says, in part, quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances, end of quote. Where are the fearless pastors who delivered potent fire and brimstone sermons against sin in all its forms? Where are they at? Smiley Joe? Osteen? Benny Hinn? Creflo Give Me a Dollar? TD Fakes? Sorry. Joyce Meyer? A.K.A. the Drill Sergeant? She looks like a drill sergeant, doesn't she? Acts like one. All these wonderful church ministers, TV evangelists, all these guys. Yeah, they're speaking out about this. Yeah. They wouldn't lift a finger against this. They are part of this. They have everything taken away. Everything. Where are the pastors who spoke valiantly without fear of retribution against a corrupt government sin society's condition, voter issues, and all of forms of injustice. Where are the pastors who care more about honoring God than being popular? Remember, the Bible says that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Think about that. But we've got a society where the vilest men are exalted, like Barack Obama. Vile. Baby-killing homosexual promoting, freedom taking, and we've only seen the tip of the iceberg and what he's done in the first three weeks. Well, the Bible says in Psalm 12, verse 8, that the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. So, when we have the vilest men being exalted, I don't know, I thought it was about Bush, now we got Obama. We got people like the Pope being exalted. People in Hollywood 
being exalted. You know, all these all these actors and people and all this garbage. People like Hugh Hefner, you know, the, the Playboy Empire. We got these devils. Wicked, corrupt politicians and, and people like this being exalted. World leaders, vile, ungodly, being exalted. Well, the Bible says when, when a society exists like that, that the wicked will walk on every side. You wonder why it's so wicked? Look who's being exalted by the world. Going back to this article, it says, uh, most pastors today would rather sell their souls, enjoy sin for a season, and not worry about the coming judgment day, than ruffle any government feathers and thereby risk losing their precious and sacred 501c3 incorporated status. Isn't that sick? Totally true, but totally sick. What a pathetic state of affairs. And then the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 10, 12, Let him think that he standeth, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Remember, pride goes before fall, and a haughty spirit before destruction. Most of these pastors are proud of what they've done. Bless God, I'm, I'm a good governmental citizen. I've done what I... I'm obeying the law of the land. I'm submitting unto the higher powers. Now, I've done a whole teaching on Romans 13. And just looking at that from a common biblical standpoint, just key in Romans, just the word Romans, you'll find it, Romans 13. An unlimited submission to government. Is it, where do we draw the line? Okay? When it contradicts the Bible. And I'm not even going to go down that rabbit trail because I've already done it. I've already done two teachings on that. So just key that in. So if that's going to be your argument to me, please, don't even bother. Access those teachings and all the supporting documentation in the PDF file which I give, try to give with every teaching I do, or at least a link where you can look at the research. Now, I've got a whole... If you key in 501c3 and you click on any of the PDFs, it, it is entitled Satan's Master Plan to Destroy the Church. And I give... And I'm going to be adding to that because I've got a lot of new material here, or, or some of this material I've had and some of it is new. And I'm going to be adding to it, but it gives you the whole layout of what I'm talking about today here. In resources and books you can look at, I've done several other teachings regarding different aspects of the subject. You can you can access those, and and uh, I've never had anybody be able to refute it. I mean, it's not my research. It's 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 uh, compiled from other people that are smarter than me that have researched this subject and ferreted out the truth and pointed out the obvious. And this is pretty obvious, cut and dry subject. I think it's an obvious and cut and dry subject to the Lord Jesus Christ too. It's very clear to him how he feels about this. Um, and then the Bible says in Proverbs 29, 25, that the fear of man bringeth a snare. We've, we've mentioned that before, and that's a lot of times the motivation for doing this. You know, fear of man bringeth a snare. But the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of understanding. It's the beginning of knowledge. The Bible says the angel of the Lord encampeth around about them that fear him. Okay? The Bible talks about, to this man will I look, to him that is of a contrite spirit, um, a meek and contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Uh, Isaiah 66, it says that. So, trembling at your word implies fear of God. And, and that's the man that God is going to look to, or woman that, that God will look to. Um, meek and humble before the Lord, not haughty and proud, not glorying in your shame, but meek and humble. Like Solomon, when he went to the Lord, he says, oh, Lord, I am as but a little child. I don't know whether to come in or go out. Give me wisdom that I might guide these people. You know, he went to him in a meek, and I understand Solomon <laughs> had problems after that. We, we did, we've done teachings on that. But there was a time when he was really right with the Lord. Um, and if you want to know more about Solomon, just keep Solomon in my, uh, uh, my page there. So anyway, uh, on the home page, Going further, have any of the pastors bothered to think about what impact your running scared and the spirit of fear attitude has on the world? The world's looking at this, okay? And the world looks at this and wants to just vomit. Like my unsaved parents, you know, they look at and, and it's so... The stuff that goes on in the church is so phony and so repulsive most of the time. Even somebody in the world can see right through it in a heartbeat, you know? And... 
you know, the one thing I will say with with my parents is they know that I that I come against this, and that, that, that's a big reason for this ministry as a Watchman ministry is is to come against these lies and to expose them and to mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Romans 16, 17, and 18. So, um, we're supposed to mark them which cause division and offenses. And we're supposed to reprove the unfruitful works of darkness. And sometimes it's necessary to rebuke such an one sharply that they may be found sound in the faith. To reprove, to exhort, to rebuke with all suffering in, in um, um, doctrine. So, again, these are, these are things the Bible talks about. Um, then she goes on to say, What kind of testimony is it to the unbeliever when the church incorporates out of a spirit of fear? Sadly, the issue of our testimony is seldom ever considered when making this monumental decision. But you can be sure of one thing. It is something that many others will think about when presented with the gospel. Now, what is this doing to the congregation? Hmm. Pastor incorporates, and okay. If, if, if he wants to do that and, and corrupt himself, that's one thing. But now you've got people coming into your church. And that same spirit... These same spirits that I had mentioned earlier that are unseen are there at the church. This 501c3 corporate institution, given its, re given its uh, right to exist by the uh, IRS and the government. You think those same spirits aren't going to influence your congregation and affect them in a very negative way? Hmm. Now you get into, you know... You're standing before God and now you're, you're looking at the fruit of what you've done. Okay, let's say you make it to the judgment seat of Christ. You're looking at the fruit of what you've done to corrupt your congregation. And they may have in turn went and corrupted someone else because of this leaven that you allowed into the church. And a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. This is a classic example of being leavened. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Foundations are corrupt from the beginning. When you do this, how is it affecting them spiritually? How many people will end up going to hell because of this issue. In the, into the lake of fire for eternity. How is that for eternal consequences? It's something that we should really think about. Because I have say, stated this before. You know, A million years from now, all that's going to matter, truly matters, who made it to heaven and hell. I understand there's rewards in these things. But who made it to heaven and hell? Who's in the lake of fire burning for eternity? And who's in heaven? So, going further, so how about this scenario? Okay, the pastor just said that Jesus not only saves my soul, but he will be my savior in every area of my life. He's my provider, my protector. Well, if he's such a great protector, then why did this church have to go to the state for protection through incorporation? Something to think about. Obviously, the church must not think very much of Jesus Christ's ability to protect them. Another good point. And then the potential convert then says, no, I don't think I'm interested in the salvation that this Jesus offers. Again, somebody plunges into hell. America's, Americans have always looked to the Bible and to pastors for moral direction. The world has long recognized the church in America as the most common and most influential institution in American history. It is for sure that our founding fathers who fought to establish this country, held the uncompromising un knowledge that the church was not subservient or subordinate to any king, parliament, president, or any other civil government body. Uh, this is from a book called The Spirit of Laws from 1748. And it says, a, a more certain way to attack religion is by favor, by the comforts of life, by the hope of wealth, not by what reminds one of it, but by one, but by what, but by what makes one forget it. This is written in like old English. Not by what makes one indignant, but by what makes men lukewarm. Okay, so it's, it's if the devil can get you lukewarm and get you focused on these other things, the fear of man, lukewarm, the comforts of life, the hope of wealth. 
You're building your kingdom on this earth. This is what you're doing. And, and Jesus Christ warns against that. Well, were there ever any true words ever spoken? The acceptance of state favors have had disastrous consequences on the churches of America. The church has effectively been silenced, she is gagged, and has become ineffective. Should you doubt, just take a look at the spiritual and moral bankruptcy of our beloved America. I believe the pastors will be held responsible and accountable to God for allowing his church to become nothing more than an arm of Rome, or the Roman model, at bare minimum, and for fearing to take an undaunted stand for the fullness of truth. God will not let spiritual treason go unpunished. It is not the way that seems right, but the way that is right, and is in full harmony with the word of God. Remember, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end are over the ways of death. Okay, you got this, let's say, this preacher, and he's brought up from a little child, okay, you know, you, your dad, let's say his dad's a preacher, and his dad went to seminary, and this and that, and he follows in the path of his dad. He goes... He's in this 501c3 corporation, corporate church growing up. He goes to cemetery. Cemetery teaches him, seminary, sorry, teaches him that it's, it's, uh, this is what you gotta do. You know, this is the way all, uh, we've, we've done it now. This is the way that, you know, you, you obey the law of the land and you gotta do it this way. So he goes through, he does it, and then he gets all of his licensing from the state in order to be a preacher. Remember, how do they end the, the, the marriage ceremonies? By the power invested in me in the state of Florida, like for my state, I now pronounce you man and wife. By the power invested in me? By who? The Lord Jesus Christ. I now, No, they don't say that. By the state of Florida, by the state of Georgia, by the state of Michigan, I now pronounce you man and wife. That just tells you right there where their power comes from. If Jesus Christ was their head, how could they... But they probably don't even think about it. Why? The prince of this world, it's like it's blinded their minds. That they cannot see. The traditions, because of the traditions of men, they've made the word of God of none effect. That's what's happening. That's what's happening, is happening, and will continue to happen. Pretty cut and dry. So, um, going further, it says... Uh, and, and again, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end are of the ways of death. So it seemed right unto them, but the end are of the ways of death. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. It's deceitful above all things. Well, it felt right. Everybody else was doing it. Uh, you know... The 501c3 Incorporated Church has allowed an unholy allowance, alliance to be established between the Lord's Church and the state. You cannot drink the Lord's cup and the cup of devils. I, uh, 1 Corinthians 10.21 Satan, who blinds the mind and transforms himself into an angel of light, has sucked the preachers into the trap of incorporation. In conclusion, God has honored his church above all others with great power and authority. His church, though, remember. Now we must come out and be separate and above all honor him with our love, our praise, and our absolute obedience. For to obey is better than sacrifice, according to 1 Samuel uh, 15.22. And as rebellion is as of, the, as of the sin of witchcraft. And are these, are these preachers not in rebellion toward God when they do this? Rebellion is, is as of the sin of witchcraft in God's eyes. Now, I'm not saying that we as Christians walk around in sinless perfection, but we don't sin that grace may be abound. We don't have a license to sin, you know, that grace may, be, may abound. You know, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we don't sin for the sake of having, you know, use not your liberty for an occasion unto the flesh, is what the Bible talks about. As far as I'm concerned, you know, the liberty in Christ we have this doesn't include us <laughs> taking this 501c3 status. It's, hopefully we've proven that. In conclusion, God has honored... Um, oh, well, I'm getting ahead of my... Or I've already repeated that. Uh, we must offer our lives as a living sacrifice to Him. We must deny and revoke the incorporated church and, re and return and restore the Lord's church to its rightful owner and sovereign head, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let God be true and every man a liar. Romans 3.4 and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 32. Well, if you continue in my word, 
then are you my, my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay, if you would really continue and read his word, you would see all the violations that this incorporation entails regarding God's word. Now, if you're interested in more, please contact Barbara Cate of the Biblical Law Center at 321-253-2374. Again, I'll repeat that number, 321-253-2374, or go up to unregisteredbaptistfellowship.com. Uh, you'll see the Biblical Law Center. You can get their contact information there. I'm going to continue a little bit further. And, um, because I've got a lot of material to cover, but it probably won't get it all covered. No, won't, definitely won't get it covered all today. But, uh, going further, this is the entitled Romans 13 and the Christ Clergy Response Teams. Now, again, I'm not going to get really into Romans 13. I've already done a whole study on that. It's redundant. Okay, but the, um, that's been done just key in Romans in my keyword search box on my homepage. This is from Gregory Williams. This is from January 21st. Just of this year, newswithviews.com. Pastors across the country have been called on by the Department of Homeland Security to join the, quote, clergy response teams. Now, we've talked about this in previous articles. In order to placate and control the people of America in the event of a local or national emergency, Jeff Farrell, a reporter for KSLA in Shreveport, claimed that for the clergy team, one of the biggest tools that they will have in helping calm the public down or to obey the law is the Bible itself. Specifically, Romans 13. And again, please access my teaching on that. This idea was affirmed in the report by Dr. Darrell Tuberville, who was quoted as saying, because the government is established by the Lord, you know, and that's what we believe in the Christian faith, then that's what is stated in Scripture. I believe that we may be endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, and to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. But I do not see where that gives us a right to blame God for the governments we establish by that consent for ourselves. According to the Bible, when the voice of the people elected Saul and established a government under his authority, God called it rejection of him. Think about that. Uh, where does it say that? First Samuel 8, 7. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people, and into all they that say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, Samuel, but they have rejected me. Meaning the Lord, meaning the Lord God, that I should not reign over them. They didn't want God reigning over them. They wanted a king. So God gave them what they wanted. When the Israelites were freed from bondage of Egypt by Moses, the people were told in Deuteronomy seventeen sixteen, quote, uh, "Well, to never go back to that type of government again." Even Jesus said. We are to not be like the governments of other nations, where their benefactors exercise authority over one another. Where do you say that? Luke twenty two twenty five, Matthew twenty twenty five, and Mark ten forty two. I'll read Luke twenty two twenty five, where he where Jesus said, quote, and he said unto them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And they that exercise authority upon them are called, are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. End of quote. But ye shall not be so. Certainly, all governments are not established of God. Were the governments of Stalin, Lenin, Hitler, Pol Pot, Mao Zedong, all ordained by God? I mean, you know, in other words, just be careful in using that logic. Paul himself was constantly getting into trouble with governments for supposedly disobeying. Now again, see my whole expose in Romans 13. Because I'm not even going to go, I, I just don't have time. Uh, Jeff Farrell of the KSLA TV reporter stated that such clergy response teams would walk a tightrope during martial law. They're even acknowledging it's just a matter of time before martial law. But these clergy response teams are going to really have to walk a tightrope. Because, see, they've got to put on the facade that they're serving God, but at the same time, their true master, their true creator, the government, and the state, and the IRS, that's who they're really serving. But the, and that's why they're going to have to walk a tightrope. Between the demands of the government on one side versus the wishes of the public on the other. Well, we know who they've already yielded to. Jesus Christ came to set 
men free in spirit and truth, the clergy response teams of Christ, this is of Christ, must act in service to his purposes, even if that means that they may appear to disobey the demands of men or their governments. I mean, isn't that the reason that all these people got martyred through all the years? Isn't that the reason that people are going to be beheaded during the seven-year tribulation? Because they're going to refuse to take the mark in their forehead or the right hand or, or worship the, the image of the beast? Well, that's going to be obeying, disobeying the government during that time period. Uh, Acts 5.29 Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man what it's all about. If lies and deception are bars and bricks that form our, men, our own mental prison, then vanity and pride are the mortar that binds them together. From the beginning, our Creator has allowed that men have the power to choose to be free souls under God or go under the authority of other men and their gods. That choice is never without consequences. Either way, you may pay for it with your life. But, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord According to the Bible, if you're a born-again Christian, praise the Lord Jesus Christ. It is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Here's another little sheet called God's Purpose for Government. The purpose of government is to restrain the lawless, according to 1 Timothy 1.9. Uh, to protect law-abiding against the violence of the wicked, Acts 25.11. And to secure to each individual a freedom of conscience, void of offense, toward God and man. The wisdom of God is making such a provision in making such a provision is very evident when we remember that the whole earth lieth in wickedness, according to 1 John 5.19. We see some very evident we see something very evident even without turning to the Bible to see what God thinks of this present evil world, and that without some restraining power the righteous uh, would be on this earth as sheep at the mercy of the hungry wolves, as we see in countries where anarchy and lawlessness run riot. The power of the church, as well as the power of lawful civil government, is ordained of God, and is very evident by reading the scriptures and the writings of inspired men. Now, why did I say lawful? I'm just going to read one verse out of Romans 13. Again, I've done a whole study on this. But, it says, for rulers... Now, you're going to see, this means a lawful ruler. Rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. If this was applying to an evil ruler, this is Romans 13.3, the, these are the verses that everybody uses to justify we obey the government no matter what. Here's the, here's the Athen test, right here, verse 3. Rulers, lawful rulers, are not a tear to good works, but to evil. Well, that's common sense. If they're lawful, but what we have the exact opposite now. We have homosexuality. Speaking out against it, we're just right on the verge of probably being thrown in prison for being a hate crime. It's already like that in a lot of other parts of the world. We have abortion and sodomy being protected, and, and all of these abominations. We we have uh, all this repression and uh, coming of free speech. So now we've got the opposite scenario in America, where rulers are going are a tear to good works. And they're the ones that protect evil works. But in Romans 13.3 it says, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. How could you possibly call Obama's administration, or what Bush has done, as a minister of God? Particularly Obama. I mean, we're getting even more black and white now. But again, if you doubt Bush's if you think he was a man of God, please go to cuttingedge.org, scroll down on the left-hand left side, and go click on the article, The Fruits of Bush. And they'll compare his works. By the fruit you shall know them. Well, it's pretty easy. So, again, this is in reference to lawful rulers, not wicked rulers, okay? Which we don't have godly rule in America at all not even close the power of the church uh, as well as the power of civil government is ordained of God lawful civil government and is very evident by reading the scriptures and the writings of inspired men uh, from 1787 until 1933 we had such a system of church and civil government in America now I'm sure there's people that could debate that 
Okay, but this is what this particular author came to the conclusion. I think he makes a good point. Um, in 1933, March 9th, FDR, one of the most wicked presidents we've ever had, declared a national emergency. See Senate Report 93-5. Uh, Four, nine, and removed us through deceit from our substance-based gold and silver economy, thus putting us in disobedience to God's financial laws in, in uh, Deuteronomy, and also where the Bible talks about having these unjust scales and balances. Again, it always boils down to money. We had the Federal Reserve formed in 1913. I believe Woodrow Wilson was, was the um, patsy they used for that, which ultimately ended up creating the IRS. They started printing money essentially out of thin air. And they ended up taking us off the gold standard in 1933 and totally off the silver standard. Really, it was about 1968. They started removing all the silver from all the coins. Nothing, nothing backing. The money really had no substance anymore. Okay? So, this unjust scales and balances. And again, uh, that's a whole other rabbit trail that you could go down. But um, there's a, uh, you can do a keyword search on the internet, how banks operate. And do, and do it with, in conjunction with a keyword called brass check. B-R-A-S-S-C-H-E-K. They've got a really good video on how banks operate. And uh, it tells you how the modern day banking system came to being and how corrupt, unbelievably corrupt that it is. And this carries over into the credit card and the whole debt-based economy and the fact that we have nothing backing our money now. No gold, no, really virtually no gold, no silver. It's unjust scales and balances and it's an abomination in the sight of God. Um, and then in 1938, when Chief Justice Louis Brandes handed down the Erie Railroad versus Thompson Supreme uh, Court decision, our Christian-based common law legal system, which until 1938 required having real damage against a human being to have a crime, flip-flopped. The decision makes the state the victim so that now any local, state, or federal government can make a crime out of anything they wish. Today, we have thousands of victimless crimes that, um, that all carry jail time. The law enforcement industry is the fastest growing industry in America. It is a business. We, uh, United States of America essentially became a corporate entity in 1933. And Again, this is a whole other subject that I do not have time to get into. I could probably do a 10-part teaching on that. But suffice it to say, we are the corporate United States of America. Okay? And um, it's, a, it's a big reason why our government is run like a business and the court systems are, are a for-profit system. And everything that they create tends to be the same way, just like the 501c3 corporate churches. The law enforcement industry is the fastest growing industry in America. Almost everyone in America commits federal felony crimes every day and are unaware until they're charged with a crime. Because there's so many crimes, you know, potentially on the books now. Today we have a government trying to legislate morality. Yeah, that's like the devil trying to legislate morality, unfortunately. Today we have government dumping drugs into the cities of America so that they can propose even more laws for nonviolent crimes for more control over law-abiding citizens. What do you mean the government dumping drugs? Well, there's a video that you can get. Uh, I talked about it before. It's about Bill Clinton, the rise of Bill Clinton. Go watch it on Google or, you, or YouTube. Uh, Go Bill Clinton's rise to power. Watch that. See what he did in Mesa, Arkansas, you know, when he was governor. See, look, and look at the trail of dead bodies, and look at how they were flying the cocaine in. And it was so well proven, and everybody that had anything to, to do with it was silenced. Our government has created the problems that exist in America. Uh, all of it. Our, our, our total dependence on fossil fuels, the, the absolute total drug epidemic that's sweeping the nation, prescription drugs that are being abused, Oxycontin, than the supposedly the illegal drugs, the cocaine. The, they've created the problem. They've let the illegal aliens in. They've done all of this and created this facade like they're, they're looking out for us. I tell you what, there's going to be some serious people amazed when they get to heaven and when they realize how duped we've all been. I know there's things I'm still, I don't. I learn stuff every day that amazes me. Uh, and this is why it's so important. You, you have to maintain humility before the Lord. Because 
I believe the Lord will continually keep showing you, if you're faithful with what he's given you, too much is given, much is required. If he gives you five talents and you double it, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Okay? You need to take what he's given you and use it. Try to help other people in as much as the Lord opens the doors to do that because you're not the one that has to open those doors. God opens them, but you're just faithful with what he's given you. And, and, and if, if you're faithful with little, he's going to give you more. I started out in this ministry with nothing. In, in the last month, we had 38,000 downloads almost on Sermon Audio. I don't know how many we've had on Google. Probably double or triple that. It's quite humbling, to be honest with you. And I don't take credit for it. Uh-uh. The Bible talks about I am the Lord thy God. I share my glory with no one. I give the Lord Jesus Christ the total glory for all of it. I hope that what I can do is point many to righteousness. You know, the Bible talks about that in Daniel, I believe, 12. And this is what we should try. This is an earmark of a Christian. Trying to point people to righteousness, to, to truth, to things that are right. And I just don't see a lot of it in our present modern day world. Uh, and, and again, I'm not saying I'm, I'm the example there. I'm just saying these are biblical tenets that we should all... These are things that are also evidence of, of salvation. I mean, it's not how, what gets us saved, but you can also show someone your faith by your works. But works do not precede faith. Works do not save you. Okay, But as a result of the Holy Spirit indwelling you as a born-again Christian, you have things like the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, faith, temperance, you know, these types of things. Uh, is the person being chastened when he, when he, um, when he sins? Uh, is there a conviction of sin? Is, are they trying to point people to righteousness? Things of this nature. Um, just things, little Christian self-checks there. So, going further with this article, the decision makes the state the victim so that now any local state or federal government can make a crime out of anything they wish. Um... Today, the churches of America remain silent and take their marching orders from the state rather than God. Uh, now, I'm going to go ahead and stop there for today, and I believe we'll have uh, at least one more part for next week. And I'll go ahead and uh, close this out in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day and this time that you've given us. We praise you for your goodness and your mercy that you've bestowed upon us. I pray, God, for my listeners, for the body of Christ, for the orphans and the widows, Lord God, and the weak and the meek that are out there, for the unborn babies in the womb, Lord, I pray, God, for your protective hand to be upon them, that you would hide us from the secret counsel of the wicked and from the insurrection of the workers of iniquity. But at the same time, I pray, God, that you would use us mightily for your glory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, through the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would use my listeners, the body of Christ, and these that I've mentioned mightily for your glory, and that through us, you would lead many people to the Lord Jesus Christ. That we would not be ashamed before you at the judgment seat of Christ. That we would hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And that we would not be saved, yet so as by fire. But we would, we would hear, well done, a good and faithful servant. That you would forgive us for any and all sins we have committed in any way, shape, or form. That the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart would be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord. That you would cleanse us from presumptuous sins and secret faults that they would not have dominion over us. We praise you for all your goodness and your benefits, Lord God. For the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, the food that we eat, the shelter that we have. Everything that you've given us, our families, our health. I pray, God, you bless my listeners, and um, you just help us, Lord. I just pray you guide us in our decision-making processes every day, that you clearly open the doors no man can shut, and shut the doors no man can open. We love you, Lord. We ask all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.